Uniquely, he was a politician who did not care very much about the spotlight. But as Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives, Hugo Ghani played a key role in what was the biggest project of the 1971-1976 Parliament. That was changing the independent constitution of 1962 to the Republican Constitution of 1976. Professor Hamid Ghani remembers his late father as a behind-the-scenes parliamentarian in that very historically significant period. He was not a frontline person, so he would not have been seen in the headlines, but he definitely was one of the, what we would call the backroom operators. He was one of those who was behind the scenes, making sure that the political machine worked to get the constitution through. Hugo Abdul Haq Ghani joined the then ruling People's National Movement in 1957, one year after it was founded by the late Prime Minister Dr. Eric Williams. Just having returned from England, where he was called to the bar at the Inner Temple in February 1955, Ghani proceeded to set up his practice as a barrister at law in central Trinidad where he grew up. But these were exciting times politically, and Ghani started taking an active part in the politics of the PNM. In 1966, he decided to throw his hat in the ring and to offer himself as a PNM candidate for the newly created Tabakid seat. He was screened by the party, but was not given the nod to contest. He nevertheless supported the party's preferred candidate in that 1966 election campaign. But when the votes were counted, it was the candidate of the opposition DLP, the Democratic Labour Party, who won the Tabakid seat. Um, in 1971, uh, my father put his name back up to be a candidate of the PNM. Um, having tried in 66 and in 1971 he did get the nod um, of the party to be the party's candidate and um, contested the election and uh, he won he won the seat um, and was elected a member of parliament but 1971 would see perhaps the most extraordinary general elections in the political annals of trinidad and tobago it involved what came to be known as the no vote campaign and while it was in this election that Hugo Ghani would finally fulfill his dream of representing Tabakit in Parliament, it was also an election that would change the course of this country's political history. It would result in the ruling PNM gaining all 36 seats in the House of Representatives. And while it finally gave his father what he wanted out of the politics of that period, Professor Ghani is of the view that the 1971 No Vote campaign really played right into the hands of Dr. Williams by providing him with the parliamentary majority he needed to change the constitution. Some people may argue otherwise, but constitutional reform had been in the air since 1969 because in the throne speech at the opening of parliament in 1969, the Hansa does record the intention of the government to pursue constitutional reform. In 1970, the process continued but was aborted because of the uprisings of 1970. So by 1971, when Williams said elections would come like a thief in the night, the elections were in May instead of November, there was a no-vote campaign, and Williams got what he wanted. The only challenge he had really was, whereas in the previous parliament, he was using a joint select committee of the House and Senate to lead the charge, there was now no opposition. So he went the route of a constitution commission and, and got Sir Hugh Wedding to chair the commission, which gave a certain level of legitimacy and validity to the entire exercise. When the parliament was convened following the 1971 general elections, Hugo Ghani was appointed deputy speaker of the House of Representatives, serving under Speaker Arnold Tomasus. Ghani, an astute lawyer, would go on to serve as chairman of a joint select committee on the age of majority and the voting age. This was the body which recommended that all important change in the age of majority from 21 to 18 years, all part of the wider constitutional reform exercise. And so it was that over that significant parliamentary period of 1971 to 1976, the legal faculties of Hugo Ghani would continue to be pressed into service by Dr. Williams. Ghani became a fixture at every party or parliamentary caucus that was set up to bring the new Republican constitution into being. And in the process, 
he developed a close relationship with the government front benches in the House of Representatives. As Deputy Speaker, um, he was involved naturally in the workings of the House, but he worked very closely with Mr. Kamaluddin Mohammed, who was then leader of the House. And a number of caucuses would be held um, to discuss a variety of legislative matters that would come before Parliament. So we had a lot of interaction and um, he was a good man. I mean, he was a likable sort of fellow. So, um, no, but he did well and I, I must say that um, I enjoyed working with him and having him in the Parliament. It was after the Wooding Commission reported in 1974 that the caucus activity related to the Constitution would be significantly increased both at party and parliamentary level, thereby increasing the amount of responsibility that fell upon the shoulders of the willing but self-effacing Hugo Ghani. But the party itself had started preparing its own self since 1971, um, because I know that he had been asked to prepare um, some um, uh, documentation with regard to some of the chapters in the Constitution for discussion within the legislative group of the party <clears throat> uh, because he was a member of legislative group by virtue of being an MP. Mr. Mohammed remembers Hugo Ghani as being particularly diligent in his attention to both parliamentary and party affairs. Well, in the party, he was there. He came to all the meetings. He never missed a meeting. One of the things about him, he was very disciplined. And this discipline must have been a quality that endeared the hard-working Hugo Ghani to Dr. Williams. In one instance, in respect of a bit of handwritten correspondence exchanged between Mohammed and Ghani, and needing the signatures of PNM members of parliament who were required to attend a caucus on the constitution, Dr. Williams took pains to append his own terse injunction against tardiness. Attendance compulsory, he wrote, signing his own initials, E.W. Dr. Williams was, was a very um, a very stern taskmaster in terms of the way that he would want um, the business of the house to be organized and that would be transmitted down to uh, the leader of the house who was Kamaluddin Mohammed and then that would be transmitted down from him to my father who was one of those who was involved in ensuring that members would attend and also taking notes and, and, and keeping a record of proceedings and, and um, things like that. Having taken an early interest in the intricacies of politics and government which he would later make his field of higher study, the young Hamid Ghani was a mainstay at his father's side. He was therefore witness to the various methods the elder Ghani would employ to ensure that his fellow PNM parliamentarians not only attended meetings, but were punctual. Another long-serving member of the PNM, Victor Scott, was a councillor on the Victoria County Council when Hugo Ghani won the Tabakit seat in 1971. Scott says he shared a close affinity with the Ghanis, then a prominent family in Tortuga. So when Hugo came on the scene, he was no stranger to me. And I could tell you that um, he was a very conscientious man. Everybody loved him because he patronized and then he took function and what the case may be. And then um, when seeing that he was a representative of the Tabakit constituency on the People's National Movement for the first time, he become very attached. Because for the first time we had PNM. In any function, what you think about Hugh Ghani? I consider the Ghani as a family, because the family, the Gaman, the um, the Ghani family in Tortuga, still there, and we still consider ourselves as family. They were so knitted. Scott remembers Hugo Ghani and son Hamid being an inseparable pair, both in the Tabakit constituency and at the party's Port of Spain offices. Hamid Ghani enjoyed the practical lessons that resulted from this close association that his father encouraged. So it allowed me as a teenager looking on to see the extent to which party discipline uh, in fact was carried out so that I, I understood from the inside the ways of um, the party discipline world so to speak. 
So it was fascinating. So fascinating that Professor Ghani has kept a wide array of documents pertaining to his father's contribution to parliament, country and party, particularly during his parliamentary term from 1971 to 1976. Hugo Ghani did contest the elections once more in 1976 as the PNM's Tabakid candidate, but he was defeated by the candidate of the newly formed ULF, the United Labour Front, which became a considerable opposition force in Parliament. Ghani eventually bowed out of active politics, devoting his attention to his legal practice in central Trinidad, but still taking pains to avoid the spotlight. Many times he would tell me, he says, I, I don't want anything. I said, but look, I've, I've got to do something. I mean, I, you know, so, you know, there was just one day of a death announcement and that was it. He didn't want publicity for his funeral or anything. Those were some of the, the things that he told me. He had a very strong set of core values that he would live by. And um, he, as I said, was a modest person, but a caring person, very caring. And, and I was very inspired in all of my studies by him. Hugo Abdul Haq Ghani died in 1999 at age 79. In fact, he, he went to court you know, on the Friday um, at the Shagwana's Magistrates Court and he died the next day, so he virtually was in the saddle right up to the very end. Apart from his son, Professor Hamid Ghani, Hugo Ghani was succeeded by his wife, the former Teresa Despi of Philadelphia, who now lives in Florida, and a daughter who lives in Trinidad.